The Monster the Guys Monster Podcast, 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 Podcast begins now. Tip tap rip rap tick a tack two. Scarlet leather sewn together, this will make a shoe. Left right, pull it tight. Summer days are warm. Underground in winter, laughing at the storm. Lay your ear close to the hill. Do you not catch the tiny clamor, busy click of an elfin hammer? Voice of the leprechaun singing shrill as he merrily plies his trade? He's a span and a quarter in height. Get him in sight, hold him tight, and you're a made man. Welcome to the Monster Guys Podcast. I'm DC McGannon. As always, I'm here with my partner and co-conspirator in all things creative, Michael. We are indeed being creative right now. Yeah, we are. We've uh, got secret projects under wraps. Secret projects. Uh, Before we get to that, this is the week in green, I suppose, for many American, at least. Yeah, Uh, I think we'll be talking about a little bit of that tonight, actually. Yeah, we will. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be talking about, again, fairies in our month-long discussion on fairies, and specifically the leprechaun, the clericon, and the red man. I think uh, we'll open some eyes on some, I don't know what to call it, I guess stereotypes that have been um, spread around and have kind of taken over the original folklore. Yeah, I think stereotypes is a good word. So we'll we'll cover some of that. Before we get to that, have you had anything cool happening this week? Yes, uh, but we can't talk about it. Oh, that's right. Our, our secret, our secret thing. If we told you, audience, we'd have to kill you. Uh-oh. No, we wouldn't. That's not a threat. <laughs> don't take him seriously. It was a joke. But yeah, um, we, I, I guess, I don't know, should I use the word prototype? We got to play with the... Yeah, I Yeah, I, I think it's going to be my cool thing for the week, too. <laughs> it was. It's our secret project that has been in the works for several months. It's gone through a few different... Incarnations? Incarnations. I think we are just moments away from launching this new creative endeavor, this new story, if you will. Yeah, and I, I came home one night, you had made, uh, you would kind of, I don't know how to talk about it without spoiling anything. I it's, guess it's let's hard just, to. Let's it's just hard. say that uh, DC made a pretty big presentation on it, and it was, uh, I was really excited to see some strings come together and some cool stuff happen, Yeah, magic I'm, happen. I'm really excited about this one. It is a secret for the moment. We will be revealing it soon. This week was prototype week, and that's kind of an interesting word, I guess, when you're talking about a story yeah. <laughs> idea, but so be it. That's what it is. So we're we're at that point. We're almost ready to reveal, and I think just putting the finishing touches and some edits on this, and, and we'll be able to share what we've been kind of wrapped up in. Uh, along with all of our other writing projects for the better part, the entire part of this year and the better part of last year. Yeah, definitely. So stay tuned to see The Secret Revealed. The Secret Revealed. And if you follow us on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram, I've actually been posting clues about once a week for the past month or so. These just snippets of things that we're working on with regards to this project. So follow us there. Just look us up at the Monster Guys and go find some of the clues and see if you can't put some of those together. Yeah, so let's get right into our discussion on fairies this week. Right up top, the segment of a poem that I read at the beginning prior to the intro music and everything was another piece by William Allingham, and it can be found in Irish Fairy and Folk Tales by W.B. Yeats, among other publications. And we just read a snippet of that. We might read another snippet a little later on, but it's a pretty long poem and one that's definitely a fun read, so I would definitely go look that up. It's titled the leprechaun or the fairy shoemaker. Yeah, I think he captures the essence of a lot of different aspects of leprechaun folklore, especially towards the end. And we might, again, we might read a bit later, but kind of how leprechauns see us is a big part of that story. And I think that's important is to understand how these creatures and these monsters that we talk about see us versus how we see them. We try to bring out some of that in our discussion. Before we get into those elements of our discussion, though, last week we talked about women of the fairy mountain. Mm -hmm. We talked about the Banshee, the Leonin-she, the Bavanshee. And one thing 
that you mentioned to me later on in the week was you really didn't feel like you went into the fairy mound itself as much as you'd like. So kind of recap that topic just for a moment, the fairy mound and why that's so important in fairy lore. That was actually something that I wanted to talk about and just completely forgot because we got caught up in the rest of the conversation, but Banshee means woman of the fairy mound. Now, the fairy mound is actually a pretty important part of Irish folklore. Let's go back and start with the ace she. The ace she. Yes, the ace she are the people of the fairy mound, if you will. And you'll hear that she in several different creatures like the Banshee and the Leanan she or the Bavanshi. In Scottish and English folklore, you have a couple of, I want to say, classes of fairies. You have the seely and unseely courts. But in Irish folklore, you don't really have those. You just have the she people as a, as a whole. And these are almost described as, you know, the old gods. Like we talked about last week, you know, some of the origin stories of fairies are believed to be, um, you know, fallen angels or dead people or mm -hmm. old gods. Right. And the ace, she uh, idea kind of leans heavily on the idea that uh, they were the, the old deities of Ireland or the old ancestors of Ireland that have gone and started living under these these fairy mountains or these these hills and burial mountains. So you have the old gods that have kind of gone in to live under these how under these hills and have become diminished. They're still very magical, still very powerful, but they are changed from their uh, deity status. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to point out. You know, remember that the banshee, the Elan, and she even later on, what we'll talk about the the leprechaun and the clerkon, the farduk. They are essentially the survivors of a race of old gods. Now, I did want to touch as well on the idea of Seely and Unseely. Right. In English and Scottish folklore, you have those two courts. You have the Seely court and the Unseely court. And a lot of people think this is good and evil. It's not necessarily good and evil. It's light and dark. Yes. Which isn't always good and evil. Right. Especially in mythology and folklore. Especially. You know, later in other parts of Europe, you have, you know, your light elves and your dark elves. And you see that a lot in modern pop culture and things like D&D. &D and, uh, you know, literature, but your Seelie court, I guess, would best be described as your regal, nice and pretty and kind fairy, you know. The your, royal court. Mm -hmm, your elves. I mean, both are royal in their own right, but you have your light elves, people who go on parades around town in great processions. They are nicer to humans. They can be malignant. They can kill at the drop of the hat if they want to, but generally they are more forgiving to the rude and arrogant human race. Mm -hmm. The unseely court is the opposite. They are the dark elves, the you know tricksters and the malicious creatures, typically the witches. Again, not necessarily evil all the time. No, not at all. Um, a lot of those creatures actually kind of dote on humans. If they find a human worth their time, they'll protect them and bring them gifts and fortune. But typically, these are going to be the, the creatures that play the darker jokes that lead to someone dying or you know breaking a leg or something. And they don't need an excuse to haul off and start attacking humans. These are kind of the creatures that you meet on those lonely paths at night that just kind of prey on people. Right. So that's just a snippet on something to keep in mind during this month of discussion on fairies, your differences in light and dark. And I guess one step further, one last thing I'll mention on that is, again, the ace, she, or the fairy people, or the wee folk of Ireland don't really have that grouping. They don't rely on, on Seely versus Seely courts. They are referred to in terms of trooping versus solitary. Yes. Uh, thanks to W.B. Yeats, an author that we referenced pretty heavily in Celtic and Irish folklore. He talked about Unseely and Seely in the other parts of the world, but he said, you know, they don't really have that in Ireland, but I will break them down into, you know, your trooping fairies versus your solitary fairies. And your right. trooping fairies, if you were to fit them in, could kind of lean on that Seelie declension. They're going to be the lighter, the, the people who are going out in great parades. And your solitary fairy is going to lean more towards that Unseelie grouping. You know, the, the fairies that are out, I would describe them as more gritty, you know, vagabond types that travel around on their own and uh, like to play tricks on humans. Yeah, okay. So just to recap, the Seelie versus the Unseelie is more the English and the Scottish lore. The the trooping versus the solitary comes more from the Irish side and specifically from the teachings and the writings of Yeats mm -hmm. in regards to the Irish folklore. Yes. Very useful to keep in mind, though, as we talk about these things. Like the Banshee would be a solitary fairy. Right. Tonight's fairy is a solitary fairy. Tonight's fairy or fairies, depending <laughs> on who you talk to, is a solitary figure. And one, by the way, where we get this, possibly where we get... 
Let me rephrase that. Possibly where we get part of this tradition of pinching people on St. Patty's Day. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion about that, that tradition, if you want to call it a tradition. Uh, I don't particularly like it. Pinch me and you might not get <laughs> pinched back, but you're not going to be very comfortable. But, you know, it's it's one of those things. I think somewhere along the way, someone could have taken a little bit of that from one of our fellows we'll be talking about tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a possibility. So let's jump into that. We're going to talk about the leprechaun, the clericon, and the red man. Yes. So let's go ahead. And, and, and in the week of green, why would we be talking about the red man? Well, you'll see very soon. Well, let's start off just with that. The okay, leprechaun. well, let, let's start with the red man. <laughs> well, I was going to say, let's start, with, let's start with the leprechaun, but... Let's start with the leprechaun, but go back to his real look. Yes. Before he was changed. Yeah, somewhere in the 1700s, when St. Patty's Day was kind of, you know, starting to be celebrated, we get this idea that leprechauns were green. And that has unfortunately become a stereotype. If you type in leprechaun, like I did this earlier, just because I was curious to see what I would find, I typed in leprechaun into Google Images earlier today. And, you know, page upon page upon page of this little happy looking dude in green. Top hat and little golden shamrock on his lapel or something. Yeah. And that's actually historically inaccurate. Lucky charms. Yeah. <laughs> it's inaccurate for several reasons. I don't reasons. want to get anybody in trouble, but your cereal may not be authentic. It's certainly not. <laughs> uh, aside from the green suit, leprechauns were never like jovial people. They were always very surly and short in the responses to humans, especially. But the, the suit itself was red. They would dress in these long, very rich red suits with gold buttons and silver buckles on their hats and gold on their shoes and their belts. One story even goes so far to say the, the person that saw the leprechaun didn't know how the leprechaun could walk around with that much, you know, stuff on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were the bling bling of the fairy world. Right. But they would dress in red and they were not the only ones. The Cloricon and the Fardarig, or the, the Red Man, would wear the same dress. So much so, and I'll go ahead and say this now, so much so that people actually believe that the Cloricon, the Leprechaun, and the Red Man are in fact one and the same. Yeah, well, and go back all the way to around the 8th century, and you have the idea of these legends coming from water spirits mm -hmm. the... called the Lukhorpan. Mm -hmm. They were merged somewhere along the way with the mischievous household fairy that was said to haunt cellars and drink all your wine or all your... Spirits? Spirits. I see where you're going there. <laughs> I got that one. And then the leprechaun being derived from the Irish words leth rogan. So you have this idea that somewhere along the way, those things kind of merged into one story. But then you have another side of the conversation that says that those are all separate stories worthy of being told on their own. Very much so. Some people believe that when the leprechaun is done with his day of work, he goes out and drinks and becomes a clericon. But if you ask a leprechaun that, they'll probably not be very happy with you and you don't want to know what will happen next to you. Right. They hate, it, according to story, they hate even being associated with the clericon who, if they're not one of the same, they're at least cousins. Because the leprechaun is a very hardworking fairy. The only one with an actual job. Yeah. He, he's a shoemaker. He is a woodworker, craftsman by mm -hmm. trade, and he works all day. He is known for toiling away for hours on end, whereas the Cloricon is known to be a lazy boisterous drunk drunkard mm -hmm. and you have a you have a very different personality between the two again the the leprechaun is short he's very hmm, grumbly he's very you know i'll keep to myself stay away from me he only associates with people from very old families who are in good social standing and that's even rare as it is whereas the chloricon is the exact opposite he's extremely jovial he's boisterous and will go out and make racket they like to get together they'll go and turn sticks into horses or they'll go and find your cat or your dog and they'll turn them into a horse and they'll ride them around all night in their bit of fun until the pet is tired. You know, a few good drinks tend to do that to a fellow. What, turning sticks into a horses? Making them jovial. <laughs> oh, making that. them ride household pets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you <true>. name it. <laughs> yeah. um, There's a reason why the Clericon is so boisterous and jovial. Yeah, but I mean, he's known for getting along a lot easier than the Leprechaun. <laughs> He's also known to protect your wine cellar. Yes. Or your liquor cabinet. 
You know, he shares a lot with the brownie or the urisk, the household spirit that, you know, cleans the kitchen and you know, uh, mends your clothing. But instead, the Chlorocon just lives in the wine cellar itself and takes care of your wine cellar and makes sure it's well stocked, you know, cleaned up and in good condition, unless you take him off. Right. And then, you And know, then he'll drink everything you own. And trash the rest of it. And trash the rest and trick you. And here's the thing about leprechauns, clericons, and the red man. Leprechauns, again, will stick around with people that are of good standing, but typically they keep them to themselves. Clericons will haunt your wine cellar, but if you make a clericon mad and it starts to haunt your family instead of protect the wine cellar, they'll stick with you. There's a there's a very old story of a guy who, you know, his priest told him to cross the river, like to pack up his house and move, but specifically to cross the river so that the clericon would not follow him. And he does that. He packs up his entire family. They move. And when they pass the water, the family kind of breathes a collective sigh of relief. And then they hear from the, you know, the seat next to them. So where are we going now, Mr. Harris? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he stays with that family. He haunts that group. Right. The red man distinctly stays with locations or towns. He doesn't really haunt a person, but he stays in one spot. Well, talk a little bit about the Red Man. Who is he? Where does he come from? He's not as well known, obviously, as the Leprechaun. Certainly not as much as the Clericon either. The Red Man is described as the same. He's around three foot in height, dressed very richly in that red suit, and wizened, you know, often with a red or white beard. He'll actually go from town to town, haunt those different locations, and he'll stop on your doorstep and ask to be warmed at the fire. And most people would let him in and, you know, let him sit by the fire. If you don't, then he'll come after you angrily. Whether or not he's angry at you or whether he's in good standing with you, the red man is known for playing pranks. And these are not very good not, pranks. Yeah, I was going to say, not very nice pranks. No. Not, not just little tricks. Whereas most monsters around the world that are, you know, not going to just eat your face off, you know, they play weird pranks on you or funny pranks on you. This guy's idea of a practical joke is killing your pet and dressing your house with its intestines. He plays very gruesome and dark practical jokes. He's still known for for not being evil. That's just his sense of humor, unfortunately. Now, he is also known if you- I wonder you... what happened to him as a kid. Uh, he grew up in a fairy mound. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Probably grew up with the Dullahan when the Dullahan, you know, poured a bucket of blood on him or something. <laughs> Listen, anybody growing up with a Dullahan is going to have issues. Yeah, I mean- We're going to get to the Dullahan, by the way. Maybe not today, but we have the Dullahan some... is my favorite fairy, just uh, like the Kitsune last month is your favorite yokai. Mm -hmm. We better get to the Dullahan. We'll get to the Dullahan. I have some very interesting things to bring the light on the Dullahan. Yes. For being such a dark figure. He's um, not a dark figure. He is nice. He is literally dressed in black. And light and happy. He wields a bone whip. He's a good guy. I like the duel. <laughs> he is not happy. He's a nice guy. We get along. I'm sure you do get along with him. Mm -hmm. We both wear black. Do you both pour buckets of blood on people? Listen, here's what I'm saying. The Dullahan's got my back, so he's got a lot of things. I'm just gonna leave. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it there. But yeah, the uh, anybody who would grow up with the Dullahan in that fairy mount, I'm sure he has to have a sick sense of humor. So that yeah, that's the Red Man, basically known as just the sick practical joker of the Irish fairy world. Okay, let's go back to the leprechaun because there are some elements about the leprechaun that even though they're pop culturists, they are rooted in history. They're rooted in the story of the leprechaun historically. Some of those being the pot of gold and his view towards humans. And, and one thing to point out is that remembering that these are old gods who have been diminished, they don't have a very high view of humans and especially their morality, their decision making. Uh, so let's go back to the leprechaun and let's pull out some elements of his history. Let's start with the pot of gold and then just build from there because that's something that is recognizable. People think about the leprechaun. They think about the pot of gold. They think about chasing him at the end of the rainbow, all that kind of stuff. And getting that bowl of lucky charms. Getting that bowl of, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the pot of gold. Where, where do we go with that one? Because that plays significance into the story of the leprechaun. It does. It's part of what makes him such a dynamic, I would say, fairy, because you have multiple things. He's not just a one-shot pony as in the monster world. 
the leprechaun is known to guard that crock of gold very, oh, what's the word? He's very stingy. He's greedy all to himself. I, you know, he's greedy, I would say, but he's more concerned about humans being greedy. He, he looks at humans and he says, you are a greedy and worthless bunch and right. I don't want you to have this gold. Does everybody feel better about themselves this week, <laughs> knowing what the leprechaun thinks of you? <laughs> this you worthless, greedy piece of... Never mind. What, you what? really didn't like people. I mean, yeah. <laughs> thus being a solitary <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> fairy. Now, in his defense, in stories, when you, you, you see him, you're supposed to grab hold of him and never look away. Right. So it, he is kind of bothered by humans as well because we, you know, we see him and you chase him down and you hold him down, you pin him. And grab you, him and hold him tight, as the poem said. Yeah. And he'll either, you know, to get away from you, he'll either try to give you three wishes. And usually those wishes turn on themselves where he'll give you the first two and then the third one, he tricks you into unmaking your first two wishes. Mm-hmm. Or if you won't let him go, he'll try to give you a gold coin from one of his pockets. And that gold coin, as soon as you release him, turns into dust and leaves. Or if you just absolutely will not let him go, then he'll tell you where the pot of gold is. And he'll usually give you like a a landmark and he'll put a ribbon around that landmark. But when you get to that landmark, you'll find that the ribbon is all over the place. It's on a tree, it's on a rock, it's on a twig over to your right. You have hundreds of these ribbons that make it very difficult for you to actually find his treasure even to the very end. They are known for being extremely tricky even when they hate the dishonesty of humans. They're also known to hoard their wealth because just like the story of Billy McDaniel, you know, a leprechaun comes up to him and says, and basically gives him, buys him a drink. But then the leprechaun demands payment and the, the drunkard, Billy McDaniels, he knows it's a leprechaun, but he's, he's still drunk. He's still rude and arrogant and says, you know, I don't have to pay you. I don't have to pay anybody. And this is a guy that's used to getting in fights and getting his way because he's good at fighting. So instead, the leprechaun, you you never see him cast the enchantment, but basically causes Billy McDaniels to become his servant through magic. And Billy McDaniels is against his will forced to get up and walk and follow the leprechaun through magic. So they have a very capricious way of dealing with humans. You never really want to deal with a leprechaun. Even if you find him and see him, I don't recall a story where anybody actually gets rich off of a leprechaun just because you, you never get the good end of the stick with them. And let's talk about their wealth. You talked about how they like to hoard their wealth. One of the things they believe to be their inheritance are the spoils of war. And so they go around collecting the spoils of war. That's how they build their wealth. Yeah, you have to remember one way. They are very old creatures. Now, because they have a trade, they have their own wealth, but these crocs of gold that they have throughout all of Ireland are remnants of old wars of the ancestors of Ireland and people that were there before the Celts. So they would find these stashes of treasure and they'd throw them in these these crocs and then they would bury them deep so that humans would not get a hold of them again. In a way, they were protecting them almost like a, a dragon would protect its hoard of treasure. And unlike the Clericon... Leprechauns are not known to be drunkards, but they do like to drink. They do. Now, some people have referred to the drink that they carry as moonshine. Moonshine is actually um, kind of an American thing, but they would drink poteen, which is something that was extremely alcoholic. Like we're talking mostly it's just alcohol. It's like 90% of alcohol. Pretty pretty strong proof there. Yeah, but it was it was an Irish drink that was homemade and actually illegal because of how dangerous it was to drink it. A lot of people would get sick or sometimes die off of it just because of how potent it was. But leprechauns loved to carry this around and would be seen drinking it all the time. Unlike their cousins, the clericon, who would just, you know, drink whatever was in front of them. You have your two separate fairies. You have your, your leprechaun that's very surly and quiet and keeps to himself, toils all day, drinks his flask, but likes to be alone for the most part. And then your jovial clericon. And we talked a little bit about the tradition or the activity or the the idea that you have to pinch somebody right. on St. Patty's Day. Lovely little tradition. And this is something fairies. Which is, which is really an American thing. It is. It very much is. But it, it has its roots in folklore, at least. We get this idea because there were several different types of fairies that would run up and pinch you. And they were invisible, so you wouldn't know where this was coming from. But if they saw something that you were doing that they didn't like, then they would actually just give you a good pinch. And some of them wouldn't stop pinching. The Clericon was probably the best known pincher. Leprechaun as well, but the Clericon in particular, if he saw a human getting drunk, 
Now, this is a bit of hypocrisy here, but if he saw a human getting drunk, then he would run up and start pinching him because he didn't like to see other people getting drunk because he thought it was bad. All the while, him being a drunkard all day long and all night long. So it's kind of a funny little, uh, I guess both of them have their funny dual natures of, Mm -hmm. you know, you're greedy, so I'm going to keep all of this wealth to myself, or you're a drunkard, so I'm going to pinch you while I'm- Because I don't like you being drunk. Red in the face from being drunk myself. Well, and as far as the pinch is concerned, there's so many different uh, conversations about that that are circulating, you know, one being a thing of pride when somebody doesn't wear green because of the traditional colors associated with Irishmen during a time of war when they were warding off invasions to, you know, the pinch was something that parents would do to kids because they would try to say, if you're going to be bad, the fairy will come and pinch you. But then they would pinch them themselves to remind them of the fairies coming to pinch them. Seems like a little bit of an excuse to pinch. (laughs) You know, and then you have typical schoolyard bully origins where kids just run around and they want to pinch other kids just to be mean. And not wearing green seems like a good excuse on a certain day of the year. Yeah. You even have some people who have touted the idea that if you wear green, it makes you invisible to the fairies, which is Mm -hmm. off base and (laughs) has no place in folklore. But found it funny nonetheless. Well, a nice brief little discussion about the Leprechaun, the Clericon, and the Red Man uh, in terms of fairy lore, specifically from Ireland. This week being the week of St. Patrick's Day, uh, we have a pretty nice tradition here. It's a tradition that you prepare bangers and mash. Yep, and I'm pretty excited. I think last year I, uh, I was not able to for some weird scheduling reasons, so I'm itching to make that dish this week. Yeah, and uh, we, we go for the traditional Irish bangers or the English bangers. I mean, pretty close to the same thing. We go for the Irish bangers, and you have a specific sauce that you prepare with this, uh, with some vegetables, that is just stunning. Why, Absolutely you. amazing. Why, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> so I look forward to every week of St. Patrick's Day for that reason, because we get to share in that dish and just the the focus on some of the history and the lore surrounding the Emerald Isle this time of year, uh, which is always very exciting for me. Yeah, so we should have, by the end of the week, a, a, a tasty conclusion to this week. A very tasty conclusion. And maybe if anybody really wants it, I don't know how secretive it is for you. Maybe yeah. if anybody really requested it, maybe we'd share a little bit of your recipe. I, I might, like, freeze dry it and send it to them. Okay. <laughs> Instead of giving them recipe to, to make it on their own, you're just going to freeze dry it and send it to them. I don't know, maybe uh, an episode of Cooking with the Monster Guys. <laughs> episode of Cooking, yeah, which is something that is not too far off. We, we've we done actually a couple of episodes, we just haven't released it yet. Yeah. Uh, speaking of other things that we do or are doing, many know, some may not have figured it out yet. Last month, during our discussion on yokai, we started our yokai podcast, which is a weekly story either an original story that we've written or a story that we pull out of the history books and then a brief discussion about a particular yokai each week. Well, this month, we've done the very same thing with fairies. We've started our fairy podcast, and they are called Fairy Tales. How do you like that? I think it's fitting. (laughs) A little little play on words there. Yeah. But we have started our Fairy Tales podcast, and again, each week, we pull a classic story Or we write an original story, and then we narrate those stories, and then we have a little discussion on the fairy of choice for that week. So right now, those are weekly story podcasts that you'll find in our normal Monster Guys podcast feed. Uh, Eventually, what's going to happen with those is those are going to be pulled out of the Monster Guys feed, and they will become their own podcast separately. And uh, we'll continue to do them and support them and, and share them through the Monster Guys podcast. But they'll have their own websites, they'll have their own podcast feed and everything else. So I'm really excited about that because it gives us an opportunity to dive deeper, more long-term into the actual stories and tales of these creatures and these monsters. Yeah, and just like with the Okai podcast, it's been fun to come up with some of the stories, and I, I'm really enjoying the, uh, looking forward to, I should say, telling some of those classic stories that exist as well from, you know, very old authors that, you know, really brought the folklore to life. Yeah, like this past week, we did The Changeling mm-hmm. by Lady Wild and uh, as one of our fairies. So uh, we just look forward to that each week. They'll become their own entity, so to speak, and they may 
go to an every other week production because one of the things we want to do at the Monster Guys podcast is always get better. For us right now, that is looking like this year we're trying to come up with some better equipment, maybe our own studio space that's a little bit more secluded and isolated and proper. Then we want to up the production value, especially on our storytelling podcast where we can do original music, sound effects, so on and so forth. So those are some ideas that we're working towards right now just to make this better for you, the listener, and uh, more enjoyable for us as we share these stories with you. So that's an exciting part of what we've got going on. If you are interested in a story set in the old country, I'll do a shameless pug here and and (laughs) say... Our Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters series of books for young adults, though we have readers of all ages. We have people who are 88 years old and people who are 8 years old, literally, (laughs) reading these books. And uh, Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters book one, The Varkalox Diary, takes place in the U.S. And it is right now free for download. If you go to Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, I think, all of those places have book one for free. The second book... Book two, Witch Moon, actually takes place in Ireland. And we focus a great deal on those Irish legends. Yes, we do. And have some of those solitary in the yes dark 30s in the mix. And have those fairy mounds that we talked about in, uh, in a couple of scenes that play pretty prominent. But we visit the old country in book two of Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters. That's available everywhere as well and through us. If you're interested in, in a cool series that's for all ages, the first book is free as a gift from us. Uh, we re-released it in 2015 with that in mind as a gift for free and then uh, jump into book two, Witch Moon, and take you to the old country and, and share with you some stories and legends from Ireland. And then book three kind of comes back here and book four will take us overseas again, but we can't go too much into that yet. <laughs> so <laughs> yet. I'll just say book four, The Dragon Gate might give you an idea of where that might go, but please uh, download your copies, enjoy it. Give us an idea. Hit us up on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and let us know what your favorite St. Paddy's Day meal is. If you share in such a tradition, if you do anything other than share a meal or pinch someone or get drunk, what what are your traditions for this month? Definitely. Might even steal some of those traditions ourselves. Might, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'll have to stop being like the leprechaun and, and share the recipe at some point for the McGannon family of bangers and mash. Yeah, you leprechaun, you. <laughs> in the meantime, we're going to we're gonna conclude this podcast with another piece of from that poem that I read at the beginning by William Allingham, we'll bid you good night for another week. I caught him at work one day myself in the castle ditch where foxglove grows. A wrinkled, wizened, and bearded elf, spectacles stuck on his pointed nose, silver buckles to his hose, leather apron, shoe in his lap, rip-rap, tip-tap, tick-a-tack too, a grasshopper on my cap, away the moth flew. Buskins for a fairy prince, brogues for a son, pay me well, pay me well when the job is done. The robe was mine beyond a doubt, I stared at him, he stared at me. Servant, sir, humph, says he, and pulled a snuff box out. He took a long pinch, looked better pleased. The queer little leprechaun offered the box with whimsical grace. Poof, he flung the dust in my face, and while I sneezed, was gone. <laughs>